Alright, welcome back to my life with plants. I'm Newman. Yeah, we're going to have a cacti update tomorrow, hopefully. But for today, i got to stick to the shade. So we're going to have a little orchid update. This is band of Falcutter. You see those roots? Mounted on this branch that's been cut from a tree in the garden. This is a van der Falkater. I gotta cut back on the watering a little bit. Uh, this is Dendrobium Lodi GCI that was growing on my in my on my balcony. But I rescued it from there because it's just, it's south facing so it gets maximum sun, it's too much. <laughs> Even though I provided shade for it, 80%, the sunlight that comes through the shade cloth is overheating it and it doesn't like it. <laughs> it likes to be cooler, so underneath here is much cooler underneath these trees. This is my Brassavola nodosa and one, two, three, four, this one, five, six, so it's starting to grow a lot. Uh, I was mounted on here, as you know, three months ago. It's been nylon, tied, tied it on with nylon onto this cork. And it is suspended from this tree with this rope. And all I do is just undo the rope, take it indoors for winter. This is Dendrobium and it's a uh, variegated monoliforme. So if you don't know monoliforme, it is native to Japan. Grows on steep uh, mountain the faces, the, the sides of mountains actually where the vegetation is very sparse and these are mainly lithoph lithophytic occasionally they will drop down their seeds and become epiphytic too uh, this one is the, hang the dendrobium hangkoki I've been waiting for new growth hasn't had any yet it's still healthy, it may, it may shoot out new growth, who knows. This is another Van der Falkater, which are native to Japan, from this area going south. And that is a, an epiphyte. Don't think it's lithophytic at all. This is another Dendrobium, Monoliforme, it's a hybrid, so this one will have purple flowers. Down here is Vestrepia. <clears throat> right down the bottom Strepia elegans doing a little check on this it should be healthier now this medium is always pretty wet and so they like growing Hasn't put out any new foliage yet, although it did before. And you can see that it has crinkling. That is because the <coughs> where I had it before the humidity was too low. I'm kind of pushing it with restrepias in this particular altitude in climate. Up here we have another monoliforme that has flowers that look like that. It's growing fine, no problems. Once they get happy and established, they are fine. And on the same conifer, these ones are mounted onto the tree, so of course they won't be coming in. 
you can take the cold temperatures here being native and this um, Dendrobium nobili we'll check up on it We got some nice big grasshoppers bouncing around These things are like toys Look at that Boing don't eat my orchids <laughs> So this one's tortillae, Dendrobium tortillae. We have no problem growing outdoors. There's one right next door, it's been out there for years. Okay, unrelated. But I'll just show you pictures. Near Regilia. Near Regilius here you got the Venus flytrap. They are in a tray that's a outdoor tray. Right? You know, can take the UV. There's a constant supply of water in there. These all can go down to minus twelve, which is ten Fahrenheit. It's freezing. They just become dormant and go down in their natural habitat and then they start regrowing so you can keep them outdoors this is a Chemicera silvestri I just thought I'd show that because these ones can grow outdoors here all year so can these Meadow Cactus Lending Healthy Eye oh, showing you a bit of everything this is the Japanese native Bulbophyllum japonicum. Now its new offset right there has done much better since hanging it under this tree. Over here we have Denema polybourbon. Something. Look at the tag, Epidendrum porpex variety alba that I rescued from myself. I think they're going to do much better on the mounts. And up there is uh, oh. am I the only one that forgets names all the time? The Poti's bicolor. I mounted on here because it was starting to go downhill. I can't overwater it now, which is a good thing. And its pot was too big. I had it in sphagnum moss, but um, I just want to say something. When you are planting in sphagnum moss, you don't have to have the whole pot full of sphagnum moss. Stick some styrofoam chips in there. All right so that you don't have much medium. You got too much medium in there and it just stays too wet, so it's not a good idea. So this is starting to offset. It's got one, two, this is a new growth, so it's great, it's doing fine. Hanging underneath this conifer. Oh. Out of the sun, of course. Yeah, you wanna put stuff in a pot. Don't make the mistake of Filling the whole pot up. This is a um, this is an uh, uh, I can't remember. It's the heat. The heat's starting to get to me. <laughs> These are related to uh, Talansias, but it has the it's often called the um, the quill pen plant because when it has the inflorescence, it looks like a big the end of a quill on a old fashioned pen, and then the inflorescence pop out of each crevice of that. <laughs> this is what that remnants is there. <laughs> Maybe here is. A keiki that was grown from uh, an orchid, a nobly type, sakuran I think, and it's doing pretty well, it's in sphagnum so it's pretty moist, and um, 
doing much better underneath these trees. I noticed that when I try to grow keikis, I wonder why they would suffer and die. It's the heat. Definitely when you're growing keikis, try not to get them over 30 degrees if you can help it. So under here, you can feel this. This is like just barely warm, which is fine. If you touch it and it's hot, you know, goodbye keiki. Uh, this is Dendrobium nobili, Angel, Angel Green Eye, which is a miniature that flowers profusely. It's one of my favorite Dendrobium nobilis. Up here is Nepenthes Alanta, so if you want something interesting to add to your orchid collection here and there in between, why not a Nepenthes? And they're not hard to grow at all. You just use rainwater or dechlorinator. If you have hard water, you put a little dechlorinator in the water, let it sit for a few days. You can use that too. There's these big old pitchers. The bugs go down inside and get trapped because they slip. Let me show you here. We can get this thing to focus. Let me try this one. All right. So you can see the rim here. This rim has grooves in it. Para, uh, horizontal. These horizontal grooves, when they get wet, they're extremely slippery and the bugs slip and fall in. And the hood sometimes oozes something delicious like nectar. Bugs will drink it and then they also fall in that way. And they always have a lot of water inside them. So they can digest stuff. <sighs> it's a neat plant. Up here is my... Yeah, the other side. Oh. This is... Uh, little Stars, I think it's called. Brassavola Little Stars. And it's still got its flowers on. Here they are. It's a surprise. I thought they'd be finished by now. They're still on. Best of all the little stars. Had more flowers that were up here on this inflorescence when I bought it. It's mounted onto this cork that's hanging from this tree and I'll just bring it inside in the winter. It also has a big pallet of animal poop fertilizer so the little growth coming away here so I gotta come out tonight and have a smell I've been too busy I can't fit it in my schedule <sighs> up here is an, a class a very good example of a monoliforme so it will become big Quite large plants. So here's my hand here. They have a straggly appearance, but uh, they make up for their flowers, which are in profusion and very fragrant, like lemon. Looking for something hardy, get one of these. This is another one that I also got from the same buyer, <coughs> seller, sorry. This one is in uh, sphagnum, but it's not a lot of sphagnum. It's only just a bit. This one isn't growing in anything at all. It's just stuck in the pot. So it's just growing on the terracotta. There would be no need to ever, ever repot this. When it's absolutely like overhung with canes, I would just cut off a bunch and pot them on. This is another monoliforme that's I don't know what kind of flower it'll have. It could be white, and up here another one. 
So they're all doing well. This is uh, little Toshie Soliel that has been recovering from the rots. Once the rot starts on the Catalia, it's a matter of keeping it dry as possible and just cutting off whatever canes start to rot until it stops. And if it doesn't stop, the whole plant will die. Up underneath this conifer is my latest purchase of a dendrobium nobili uh, angel green eyes it's a nice full plant and it's in a plastic pot hanging up underneath this tree in full shade in the winter time I will bring it out and hang it up under this tree which is deciduous Zooming about in the garden is a dragonfly. You can see it went over there. Those are the goldfish. Under here is a native Cymbidium garingii. This is the coldest hardy one from Japan. Not the Chinese variety, but the Japanese one. And they do have pseudo bowls that are about this big with the growth, and it is terrestrial. Occasionally, it will be epiphytic. Ugh. Grows in well draining soil. It's under here. I'm going to do a bit of weeding again. This is an optimal position for it, so it's been clumping and clumping, growing much better. Yeah, I'm hoping that when it does set seeds, which it did last year, those seeds will just develop underneath here. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> Could be wrong, but I have marked where I think <coughs> seedlings came up. I think these are seedlings, or it could be another plant in the garden. But we will know later. It's hard to identify it, really hard. Okay. It's just not mistaken how hot it is. Push through these shrubs here. All right. This is Mosquito Haven. All right, up here is Dendrobium monoliforme that's mounted to these trees, to this tree. Ugh. And another one down here. Another one here. And this is Vanderfell Cutter. And it's looking nice and healthy. It'll do fine through the winter, no problem whatsoever. All it has to do is grow a more extensive root system. And then it'll be on its way. Right up in the crown there is another monoliforme. So they are all growing in this tree. Some other interesting plants in the garden is this. Sorry, I don't know what it is. I would think that they are native to Japan. Mm. 
they're popping up and growing these flowers. <sighs> Quite a few of them. Got to get out here and be weeding. All right. I think that about covers everything. Almost. We're going to go over here. Because I'm just going to forget. But before I forget, let's have a look at the an orchid that likes water. And it's true what they say. Sologenes <sighs> Intermedia. I'm just going to put it down. Alrighty then. Take a look at those bulbs. And the new growth. Well, this new growth has no marks on it. It is stinking humid here in Japan. And this thing is growing happily and it gets watered every day. And this medium. I try not to pack that in too tight, but uh, this sphagnum moss that it's in, it's moist all the time, never dries out. And when it gets watered, it gets watered when it's moist. And you don't have to care. Because that is the key to a selogeny growing them. They're much more happy now. Whereas before I was getting this kind of stuff happening, the tips are going really black and the new bulbs and the growths were drying up and the leaves were falling off they were stunted <coughs> an example of that would be this tiny little bulb here and that one now we got roots coming out and this is the new growth so selogenies you can just water them you don't have to worry about rot they won't rot they have different roots than fowls and vandas. They are different. They are more fibrous. <sighs> they are very fibrous roots with a lot of feeder hairs coming off them. They're very hairy roots and they just take up as much water as you can give them. That's Fias. Flavis. It's been putting out new bulbs. These are the new bulbs and the leaves. So these are the these this is where it's gonna flower from this year. <sighs> Let's just take it out, shall we? This selogeny, by the way, has a lot of holes in its pot. It's filled with holes. Like a lot of people and I don't pull my plants out often enough but I did pull this out not too long ago probably a couple of weeks ago I did pull it out but you should and if you can't maybe you got too many and you can't look after them anymore oh yeah nice see these new bulbs here these bulbs are quite similar to selogeny actually if you look at them these are the old ones they don't have any leaves because they're deciduous and also they are storage for nutrients for the plant 
One, two, three, four, five, and a new one coming up. A late one. So that means I will have, I should have inflorescence to pop up on all of those new five growths with beautiful yellow, lemon fragrant, cymbidium looking flowers. Another member of Phaeus family is Tangerillii, which is an invasive species to tropical places like Florida and I think Hawaii, but it's an Asian species. This is a beautiful plant, these corrugated leaves that are reminiscent of a lycast. So that's doing really good and it's in a a mix that's a combination of potting mix and um, cocoa chips and pumice. Although when I bought this plant, it was growing on a rock wall more south here of J Japan. Which you can tolerate that amount of cold. And it was growing on a rock wall and just normal soil. Although it would be pretty moist I would say so these plants do not like any direct sun at all no no do not give it direct sun especially in the summer it will hurt it and set it back and then it will slowly die even after you try to recover it it will be beaten and done you might think it can recover it but it won't This one gets plenty of water. I really want to give it a sniff, hang on. Fresh smell. This is my one and only Cymbidium, it's not a native. And it is called Forest Fairy Hanakari. And this has remarkably beautiful flowers. This is why I picked it up. I thought, geez, Forest Fairy, perfect name. And this has been growing fine and kept it out of that sun. So I lost three or four submediums last year. You can see here, look. Oh my gosh! You see that? It's heat. Your temperatures here, they get. Most days is 35 to 37 degrees when, when you're in the sun. It's probably like 30, 33 degrees or something where I am in the shade. But that direct sun, the cymbidium does not like it whatsoever. Which tells me that it's a higher altitude. Or they grow under the canopy of trees they, they have to have it they do not like hard summer sun so it's absolutely out of the sun you can see in its enclosure here that shade cloth that's what keeps it going and alive <laughs> so success Something else interesting I want to tell you about some mediums is that in this porch here, in the winter, we get down to minus eight degrees, minus eight. As long as this is out of the frost, and if you keep it dry, then it survives with little to no damage, but nothing, nothing at all actually. So as long as it's protected from any frost getting on it, you can go right down to those minus temperatures. But the thing is, is that it would like a little more water. So from the springtime, early spring, it'll be trying to push out its flowers. And if it doesn't get water, it will abort them. And you know, our winters are colder than in its native habitat. So one thing I have to do is when it's developing those flowers, it'll be time to bring it inside because it'll be still uh, but here's the thing, if your rooms are heated 
If you go central heating, you bring them in, all those buds will fall off. So the best you can do is to give it a little water when it's trying to develop them. It shouldn't rot, not with a little bit. And if it aborts them, it'll try to push out a second flush. That's what they do. And um, hopefully we will see some of them. But because of the central heating, that is one of the major problems of culture for bringing your cymbidiums in. They need the cool temperatures. So it's got to stay under 20 degrees. If it goes slightly over it, even two or three degrees, all the buds fall off. It's terrible. So if you, unless you have an unheated room, then you can get your buds to develop in there. But for me, I'm just going to do it outside. So what can, can you... So this is what it looks like when they're set up in this mini greenhouse. It's been working so I will just continue with what I've been doing because it has been working. This totally and I would just use it for the winter and they would be under the trees. But it's been it went, we went, we went, I went through all the way through August with them in here, so it's done the trick. It's been shady enough and cool enough like a tree. So you can see the, where the sun is, right? Yeah. This is the porch, so you can have a look at it. Okay. It's quite deep and Having a porch like that, the frost has a lot of trouble getting under there and it actually can't reach. By the time it gets to here, it can't go under because the house gives off heat. And that, dis that, uh, that dissipates or stops the frost. Also having them underneath trees will do the same thing. Yep. One more thing before I go, we're gonna have a, a lot of smelly flowers opening. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You see one over there, eight. This is the Pelia Gigantia. It's the toughest and the most widespread of the Stapelias and the biggest. That's why it's called Gigantia. Velvety, felty. What's great about a Stapelia Gigantia is um, you can take a cutting off it, like right here, chop it off. I got one, I got a couple here. One, two. And these, I've already like sealed up over the calloused. I cut them over a month ago. And even when they shrivel up, really shrivel up, you can just keep them like that. You can keep them like that all winter inside, in a dark place that has no light at all. Just air circulation. You can just leave them like that and then in the spring plant them in a well-draining mix in a pot. And then they will grow and make big stinky amazing flowers for you. And then you can chop it back up put it back in the house. You don't have to keep them in a pot with all the roots intact and everything. You can just cut them. Yeah, it's easier. It's probably, probably what I'm gonna do uh, so I don't drive everyone nuts bringing in plants. And we'll just chop it up and I'll repot it. And then it'll grow again because that's part of their nature, their nature to do so. They seed a lot and grow and flower and die back. It's eunuch, eunuch, uh, what is it? Stapelia unicornis that actually had a different flowering 
time. It actually flowered during the summer. This one's an autumn flower. Okay, that's it. This is the end of the video, and these are my Ceres Jamakarus. And they also put up with that low, cold temperatures, which they surprised me. They can do it as long as they kept dry. And you got low humidity in the winter. They were put up with the freeze. And the frost tries to get in a little bit on them, but they get through it. And thanks for watching. Don't forget that looking after your plants is not a chore. It's part of your self-care. And that care that you give to your plants usually spreads to everything that you do in daily life. And having too many plants is not greedy. It's not greed to me. It's a... It's a care thing, caring for a lot of plants and actually giving a damn whether they live or not or flower or anything like that. It's a good, valuable thing to have, to have that little bit of pressure on you to look after many plants and to make them flourish and everything like that. I'm pretty sure that that's valuable with a lot of things in your life. Wow, look at that, the first flower on my Sedum Spectabilis, and this Sedum Spectabilis is native to Korea and Japan, it's their native Sedum, there's big thick leaves on it, and once it's, and it has a fragrance, that draws in all the butterflies and the bugs and once it's fl finished flowering you can cut the stem right down to here and stick them in a well draining mix and they will produce little tiny offsets that will grow into the soil and you don't pull the stems out you leave them in there and then in the spring they will develop little buds and grow a new bunch but this whole plant will die down for the winter and take a rest and then in the springtime you cut all the old stems off and down in the corm there's a big corm underneath their tuberous roots little tiny cabbage like crassulas will start growing all on the surface which is pretty nice I, mean, I like looking at them they're like really compact crassula cabbages that all grow in there and then as the summers come they start to stretch up and then they have the buds and they flower in the autumn and they bring a lot of bugs so because I like that plant they keep propagating it and somebody kicks me up the bum for it but whatever they have some in the garden too look all the bugs will be coming and one more over here. So these are the ones I did about two years ago. And they've already become big plants. Oh, the bugs will enjoy that. One more sedum. This is a native of Japan too. And this one will have flowers just like that, but a little later. And this one you can also cut off the old stems before they die. Put them in the soil and I'll have little tiny cabbages pop up. And this one is totally cold hardy, so it's found on the most northerly island of Hokkaido in Japan, growing on cliff faces. Nice seed in there. Nice contrast in your garden, right? So that you have a lot of different colors. So these stay seed in spectabili, uh, spectabilis. Uh, could you grow them in England and countries like that? You could if you just put the pot underneath the eave of the house so that the rain doesn't get on them. They'll do perfectly fine. They're very hardy. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching.
See you next time. Bye-bye.